Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. With me is Michael Cremo, who is the co-author with Richard Thompson of the classic book, Forbidden Archaeology, The Hidden History of the Human Race, and a subsequent book called Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. Welcome. Michael. Good to be here. Yes, it's a pleasure once again to be with you and to be yeah, exploring ideas that aren't discussed enough, I think, in, in our culture, which is, I guess, why we're here. Um, Vedic philosophy is unique, I think, amongst the cosmologies of the world in terms of the uh, extreme length of the time cycles involved. Yes, the, the Vedic cosmology involves a cyclical concept of time and the basic unit of this Vedic cyclical time is called the Kalpa or the day of Brahma. It lasts for 4,320,000,000 years. It's followed by a night of Brahma, which lasts for 4,320,000,000 years. Then there's another day, another night, another day, another night, and the cycles go on endlessly. And during the days of Brahma, life, including human life, is manifest in the universe. And during the nights of Brahma, life, including human life, is dormant. Mm. Well, it would seem as if the uh, ancient sages had a, a grasp of mathematics to come up with numbers that large. Most other cosmologies are uh, expressed like uh, Christian theology that the planet is some 5,600 years old. Yes, I think Carl Sagan, a famous astronomer who had a television show called Cosmos, mm -hmm. uh, announced in, in one of his episodes that he thought just what you're saying, that among the cosmologies of the world's culture, the Vedic cosmology seemed to be the one that had time scales of the same order of magnitude as promoted by modern astrophysics. So I think that's, that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. And if, if I recall correctly, um, most scientists would say that life on Earth is about four billion years old. Well, it's, it's interesting that if you look at the Vedic cosmology and the Vedic cosmological calendar, it would say we're about halfway through the current Kalpa or day of Brahma which means that the beginning of the Kalpa or the creation cycle would have been uh, a bit over two billion mm -hmm. years ago. So according to the Vedic cosmology, that's when you would expect to see the first signs of life on Earth a few billion years ago. Mm -hmm. So as I was saying, it's in the same ballpark yeah. as the modern scientific estimates. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the most fascinating aspects of uh, Vedic thought to me is the notion of, of the avatar, that uh, uh, somebody in, in a human body, for example, can be a, an embodiment of a deity. Avatar means one who descends. That's the actual meaning of the Sanskrit word. Mm -hmm. One who comes from a higher level down to a lower level. And 
The Vedic texts like the Puranas, the Bhagavad Purana or Srimad Bhagavatam as it's sometimes called, for example, they give lists of avatars of Vishnu, the supreme god, mm -hmm. according to that cosmology. So yes, there is the concept of avatar, one who descends from a higher level to a lower level. I think there was a movie a few years ago, a Hollywood picture called Avatar. Indeed, a big yeah. hit. Yeah, well it has its roots in this mm -hmm. Vedic cosmology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that m many of the moviegoers appreciated that <laughs> because today the term avatar sort of means a, uh, a character that you play in an online video game. <laughs> well, even that is relevant mm -hmm. because it's a projection of yourself from your normal circumstances into the artificial or virtual reality mm -hmm. environment of the video game. And actually, according to the Vedic cosmology, the world that we inhabit is something like like that. It's a kind of virtual reality mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. for conscious selves who aren't fit to exist on what we would call the level of pure consciousness or Brahman as it's called mm -hmm. in the Vedic text. There is a spiritual world mentioned in those Vedic texts. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I suppose for many uh, Americans or people who are brought up in a monotheistic culture, one of the most puzzling aspects of, of a doctor philosophy is the notion of a pantheon of, of deities, and uh, especially when you consider the notion of the avatar, that uh, Krishna is the avatar of Vishnu, for example, H how they relate to each other seem very confusing to many people. Well, it, it may seem confusing, but you know, we see that a single person can be the source of many identities. You could take Tom Cruise, for example, or any actor or actress who has an original personal identity, but in the course of many different films mm -hmm. will play different roles while remaining the same original person. Yeah. So in in the Vedic text like the Srimad Bhagavatam, we can find lists of avatars of Vishnu or Krishna. And it is specified that among all of those different avatars, which are considered to be forms of God playing different roles, mm -hmm. that one of them is the original personality and the others are role-playing expansions of that original personality. So, in a sense, the Vedic cosmology, as I understand it, is also monotheistic in mm -hmm. the sense that all of these different forms or avatars of God are expansions, role-playing expansions of an original personality who is, in essence, one. Maybe a, a little difficult concept to grasp, but I think it, mm -hmm. if we think about it a little bit in terms of the analogy of an actor playing different roles, we may get a grasp of mm -hmm. it. Now, just for clarity, you mentioned a, a particular uh, document, the, I think you call it the Srimad Bhagavan, is that, is that right? Srimad Bhagavatam, which Bhagavatam. is another name for uh, the Bhagavad Purana. Mm -hmm. 
The Puranas are the category of Vedic literature that deal with cosmology and history and related topics. They're a little bit different than the texts that deal with strictly philosophical and epistemological issues mm -hmm. like the Vedanta Sutra, for example, or the Rig Veda, mm -hmm. or things of that sort, the Upanishads. Mm -hmm. The Puranas explain the origin of the universe, or I should say universes. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's an important uh, idea because as, as I understand it, uh, the Puranas uh, express uh, the idea that the, the, the deity Vishnu is, if, if I remember correctly, correct me, he's asleep, but as he sleeps, universes are exuding from the pores of his skin. Yes, for the purpose of manifesting alternative realities for conscious selves who are not fit to exist on the purely spiritual level of reality, Vishnu expands himself in the form of Mahavishnu, who lies on the causal ocean, it's described, and he is sleeping and dreaming. And in this dreaming state, which is technically called susupti in Sanskrit, when he breathes out, millions of universes expand from his body. And when he breathes in, all the universes are drawn back into his body. And when the universes are expanded, he injects into them conscious selves. So the length of his breath, you know, one mm -hmm. breathing in and breathing out is 311 trillion 40 billion years, according to the text. So it's a, it's a large, Figure. Much larger even than uh, our astronomical calculations regarding this universe. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, for me, it's interesting that there's some parallels with modern cosmology and mm -hmm. that astrophysicists are now positing the existence of what they call multiverses yep. or multiple universes, but it's an idea that was expressed thousands of years ago in the pages of the Puranas, like the Bhagavad Purana mm -hmm. or Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. Well, that that's fascinating. Now, the, can you date the Puranas? Uh, for example, are they uh, around the same age as the Upanishads, which I think is maybe a little more than 2,000 mm -hmm. years old? Well, the knowledge itself mm -hmm. is considered to be eternal, mm -hmm. but it's expressed in terms of <clears throat> different times and places. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many different universes, they're created and destroyed. So the same knowledge is made available in each universe you know, from the time of its beginning, and mm -hmm. it's available till its end. Mm -hmm. But the way in which it's made available can change. Originally, it's the knowledge and the Puranas and the other Vedic text is passed on orally yeah. in the form of sound vibration. But at a certain point in the cycles of time, people's memories become exceedingly short, mm -hmm. and they're not able to retain uh, something simply by hearing it. Mm -hmm. So then things are set down in textual form, right. written form. But a written form has to be copied again and again mm -hmm. and again because the medium is temporary. Mm -hmm. 
So the oldest extant manuscript forms of the Puranas are probably a thousand or two thousand mm. years old, but the that doesn't mean that's when the knowledge I, mm-hmm. began. I, I understand, and it it would seem as if those writers or sages, as I would call them, who who wrote the Puranas had a, a mentality that could think in terms of billions and even trillions of years. Well, there's a phenomenon associated with these sage, sages that's called in Sanskrit Tri Kala Gya. Tri means three, Kala means time, Gya means to know, which means they had the ability to perceive all three phases of time, past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something like that in the theory of relativity as developed by Einstein. He talked about the, that the reality is that in terms of time, everything is simultaneously present. Mm -hmm. But according to these Vedic texts, these Vedic sages had the ability to, they had access to all those aspects of time. I mean, Einstein said that as individuals, we're kind of limited. We experience time linearly when actually it's a -hmm. a field in which everything is present simultaneously. I know Einstein wrote a a letter to the widow of uh, a a scientist who was a friend of his in in which he said, you know, your husband and I would both understand that uh, he is still uh, exists in uh, not in our time as we perceive it, but in this larger sense of time. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Again, it's another parallel between the Vedic wisdom and you know the wisdom that Einstein mm-hmm. developed, uh, namely this ability, this what Einstein saw as the p- potential ability at least, for someone to perceive all three phases of time simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Now, when I think of um, the Vedas and I think of your work, uh, the subtitle of your book uh, is a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. So the the Puranas and the Vedas and the Upanishads have something to say about the origin of human beings. Yes, and I called it a Vedic alternative rather than the Vedic Mm -hmm. alternative because there are different schools of Vedic thought. Yes. And I want it to be explicit, you know, Mm -hmm. that I'm presenting a Vedic alternative, because there may be followers of different schools of Vedic thought that might have different ideas. Mm -hmm. And even myself, I don't claim to have a monopoly on truth. I I think uh, the idea of exclusive claims to truth is one of the big problems in the world today. So I don't claim to have a, a monopoly on, on, on truth, but I'm expressing the truth as I know it. And in terms of what it means for human origins, first, we have to understand that according to the Vedic cosmology, any body a human body, a plant body, an insect body, a fish body, is a vehicle for a conscious self that has come to the world of matter. So it's just a vehicle. And those vehicles are produced by higher intelligences in the cosmos that understand that if a conscious self is going to function in the world of matter, they need different kinds of vehicles. Mm -hmm. And because the conscious self can have different kinds of desires to fulfill, 
there is a full range of vehicles that's provided. Mm -hmm. and that, so you, what you're suggesting is, you know, just as when I need a vehicle and I go outside to the parking lot and get in my car, uh, which was designed by engineers, that there are beings of higher consciousness who have, in effect, designed these bodies. Yes, they've anticipated the different kinds <laughs> of desires that a conscious self may have to act in this world, just like the owner of a, a large automobile or motor vehicle manufacturing company will anticipate that according to a person's needs, taste, and income, what they're willing to spend or what they have to spend, they will require a certain type of vehicle. So anticipating that, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, automobile manufacturer or motor vehicle manufacturer will, will make a whole series of cars, vans, trucks, recreational vehicles, mm -hmm. and customers, according to their taste, income, and desire will select a certain vehicle. It'll be provided to them and they'll use it. That may be another way of thinking about reincarnation. Yes. And the, the conscious self that's occupying the vehicle in each case is the same, whether it's in the vehicle of a fish or an insect or a monkey or a human being, it's the same kind of conscious self that is there. And that's why there's this reverence and respect for all <laughs> forms of life mm -hmm. that is found in those who are followers of the Vedic wisdom, because they understand that, that in each type of bodily vehicle there is the same kind of conscious self. Mm -hmm. Just like, say, you know, myself, I'm a person. I could ride a bicycle, I could go so fast. I could ride a motorcycle, go faster. Get in a car, go faster. Get in a boat, travel on the water. Get in an airplane, fly in the sky. Get in a space capsule, fly in outer space. I'm the same person, but according to the vehicle that I have, mm -hmm. I can operate in different ways. So the conscious self that's in the vehicle of a tree body, for example, can't move around very well, but mm -hmm. it's a conscious self mm -hmm. there, just, just as it's the same kind of conscious self. It may have even been part of my own evolutionary history mm -hmm. to have once been in a tree vehicle rather than a, the human vehicle that I'm now occupying. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that uh, time is cyclical in uh, Vedic uh, cosmology. Does that mean it repeats itself, that there's no uh, evolution? Well, there's repetition of cycles, just like we could say there's a repetition of cycles in just the normal time sequences that we think about. Mm -hmm. Years, for example. Each year goes through the seasons in the temperate zones yes. of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, spring, summer, fall, winter. So there's some similarity, but it's not exactly mm -hmm. the same. Yeah, so the Vedic time cycle is like that. There's a, a basic pattern, a sequence of cycles in which there are different conditions. They were called uh, yuga cycles. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a cycle of four ages a golden age called Satya Yuga, followed by, and in that golden age, 
most people are spiritual. They live very simply and naturally. Their ethical systems are very highly developed. It's followed by the Treta Yuga in which selfishness begins to become more dominant. People divide themselves into classes and groups. Then that's followed by another age called the Dwapara Yuga in which those tendencies become even more intense. And then, then it's followed by what's called the Kali Yuga, which is an age of environmental and social degradation on large on a large mm -hmm. scale, which is the time cycle that we currently inhabit. And I, I think we can see those things happening, but it, it'll be followed by another golden age, another Satya Yuga, mm -hmm. and you take 1,000 of those cycles of four Yugas, that's a Kalpa, or day of Brahma. Mm. Very interesting. Now, w one of the fundamental ideas that I've heard over and over again when I discuss Vedantic philosophy with people is the notion of uh, sometimes expressed as Brahman equals Atman, that the, the conscious self of each individual is the same ultimately as the conscious self of the whole universe or of the multiverse. Well, as I mentioned, there are different schools yeah. of Vedic thought. Mm -hmm. And one of them is called the Advaita school. Mm -hmm. Dvaita means difference, and Advaita means no difference. Mm -hmm. So, in that school, the perception is that the individual conscious self is the same <clears throat> as the supreme conscious self. That when it's liberated from its bodily vehicle, it will merge into the totality of the Brahman existence, and everything will simply be one. I'm not a follower of that mm -hmm. particular school of philosophy. I'm a follower of one of the Dvaita schools, which maintain that just as I am individual and personal now, I have always been a distinct individual person and will always be a distinct individual person, even in relationship to the Supreme Brahman, which is also in terms of the Dvaita philosophy, individual and personal. In other words, there will always be a personal relationship mm -hmm. between the individual conscious self, the Atman, and the Param Atman, the supreme conscious self, one of loving service. I see, but not identity. Not complete identity. You know, the example that's given in terms of analogies used by the sages who are members of this school that I'm representative mm -hmm. of. If, if you have a green parrot fly into a tree, a green tree, the parrot doesn't disappear when it enters the green tree. The green parrot is still the green parrot, and it may taste the fruit of that tree, but it doesn't become the mm -hmm. tree. I see. So one might say that uh, you are a dualist. A dualist. That's what Dwaita means. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, once again, Michael Cremo, this has been a fascinating and enlightening discussion. Thank you for being with me. Great to have been with you and all your viewers. And thank you as well for being with us.